Hello and welcome! I'm DDF Racer and today I'm going to be taking a look at the June update for Race Room Racing Experience and on the face of it there's not that much to look at really. Compared to previous Race Room updates the change log's pretty short. There's a brand new replay system which includes the ability to add keyframes and automate the camera. The new UI previously seen in the car's setup menu now extends to the options menu and in-game sessions too. And there's improved visual effects such as sparks now being present and also better tyre smoke generation. Oh yeah, one more thing actually. The entire force feedback has been completely reworked. You see, it might not be a huge update in terms of new features, but for at least anyone using a steering wheel, this is a massive update in terms of change. And we're not talking about a few tweaks here and there, guys. This is a complete rewrite of the code that basically translates what's going on between your virtual car and what you feel in your hands. And it's for this exact reason that force feedback is possibly one of the most single talked about topics in sim racing. It's the main link between what the sim is actually doing and what you're perceiving the sim to be doing. It gives you information on grip, bumps, curbs, and effectively helps you to understand the behavior of the ones and zeros underneath you. Each sim does it differently, everybody has their own personal preferences, and everyone's got an opinion on what feels good. Not only that, but the exact same force feedback settings on one wheel, such as the Peasant's gear-driven Logitech G29 that I'm running, can feel completely different on another wheel, such as the super powerful, rip your wrists off if you're not careful, direct drive Fanatec DD2. So yeah, this is huge. Perhaps the best way to try and describe what's changed in Race Room is to have a look at the thought process behind it and what's different on a technical level. Previously, Race Room relied heavily on, for want of a better word, artificial effects. You might have also heard them referred to as canned effects. For example, when the front tyres were nearing the limit of grip and about to understeer, the wheel would start to vibrate and even go light by a pre-programmed amount. When running over the curbs, the vibrations that you felt wouldn't have been related to the actual shape or size of the curbs themselves. They were just a generic vibration triggered when you happened to drive over a certain part of the track. The biggest one, however, was that the feedback wasn't always tied directly to the car physics and didn't take into account basic things like steering geometry or gyroscopic effects. The devs put out a blog post which explains it all in much more technical detail than I could ever attempt to here, link in the video description below, but Race Room found themselves in a situation where they were pumping out physics updates but no one was actually feeling those changes because, well, the force feedback wasn't taking any of it into account. It was a carryover system from the earlier days of Race Room when the physics were much more basic and the force feedback had to basically fake it to compensate. For example, the super small Formula 4 car would feel exactly the same as the absolute unit that is the Bentley GT3, just scaled up or down to match the weight of the vehicle. Sure, these two cars were running on different physics, but the way those physics were conveyed to the steering wheel weren't too dissimilar and not always taken into account what was happening with the suspension or the tyres. Don't get me wrong though, the information regarding grip available in the car was still going through the feedback to your wheel, but it wasn't always the right information. That goes some other way to explaining why certain cars felt better or made more sense than others. But in order to really make the most out of these new physics, the feedback had to change. The first thing you'll notice is in the settings, which are all displayed in this fancy new menu design, but I'll go into that in a little bit more detail very shortly. There are significantly fewer settings to change now, and that's because those old artificial flavors of feedback just don't exist anymore. You have a few things like maximum force, minimum force, and linearity, each with recommended settings on the right hand side of the screen by the way, based on the type of wheel you're using. No more guesswork, it's all right there on the screen easy. Below that, you can add in some enhancements or boost certain effects if you like, such as bump amplification, engine vibration, and gear shift kicks. But this is all personal taste, so have a play around and see what you like. Me personally, I only run the bump amplification, but up around the 50% mark because I like a little rattle in my wheel feel. There's a lot less to play with in the options now, there's a lot less to customise. But that's because you don't really need to anymore. By being able to tap into the actual physics of the car, you know, what's going on with the steering torque, the, the forces on the actual tyres, the suspension loadings, all that kind of stuff, you get a feedback that doesn't need to guess what's going on. You've got a feedback that knows what's going on. 
I've done some extensive testing over the last few days, trying many different card track combos, and I'm not going to lie, it feels very different. Now, I know it sounds obvious saying that now, keeping in mind the fact that the force feedback code has been completely written from scratch, but it was definitely a bit of a shock to the system. Initially, it didn't make any sense to me, and I was actually a little bit worried, even thinking to myself, oh no, race room, what have you done? The cues I was used to feeling weren't really there anymore, or at least not as pronounced. That feeling of excessive lightness in the wheel when the car starts to lose grip, the rattling understeer of scrubbing tyres along the track, or the exaggerated bumpiness of the road surface and the kerbs. Thing is though, none of these effects were real, or, well, should I say because <laughs> none of this is real, none of this was related to the physics of the car. I wasn't actually driving properly before. I was relying completely on the wrong information that was being given to me by the feedback. So I had to put all that to the back of my mind and kind of forget what I'd previously learned. And you know what? When I did that, when I stopped trying to compare it to the old race room force feedback and just take it for what it was, it just made so much sense. It only took a handful of laps for it to click and, I mean, well, it, it didn't feel like race room, mind you, but you know what? It felt really good. Like, really good. What we have now is a 100% physics-based approach, which has a much more authentic, true-to-life feel, which, instead of faking it, actually takes into account the forces acting upon the wheels and suspension. And like I said, it just makes sense. It's much easier to feel those forces now. The suspension really does load up through the feedback, and you can drive on the limit and save slides so much more easily. And because the feedback now takes into account the inertia of the tyres when they're flexing and distorting all over the place, the car will actually want to pull you back in the direction of momentum when you increase the slip angle, just like a real car would. I mean, you'll still lose time by sliding around, but now you can actually feel the slide so much better and you can apply the proper corrections. This is particularly noticeable on the older style cars with more travel in the suspension, such as the NSU and the Porsche Carrera 964. Bumps in the road surface no longer seem random too. A great example of this is the backstretch of Watkins Glen. There's a few slight irregularities which will actually pull the wheel ever so slightly and, especially in VR, this just boosts the immersion so much. Stationary forces now feel a lot nicer too. For example, when you're sat on the grid or sat in the pit box, you can actually feel a noticeable difference when you first switch the engine on and also when the power steering kicks in. Something to keep in mind though is that because the force feedback now relates directly to the physics, each car is going to have its own unique feel. And I know that's a bit of a Captain Obvious thing to say, but downforce cars are now going to have much higher loads on the tyres and the suspension, so... This part is extremely important if you want to get the most out of the new force feedback. Go into the menu, find your controller bindings, and make sure you have something assigned for these controls. Toggle force feedback meter, modify HUD position, increase force feedback multiplier, and decrease force feedback multiplier. Whenever you first drive a car, you're gonna need to set up your force feedback multiplier for each individual car. Now, these are generally at the correct level by default, but you may need some tweaking depending on which wheel you're using. Before you start your outlap in practice, use your new keybind to bring up the force feedback meter and use the HUD modifier keybind to move it around and make it bigger or smaller. I tend to move it away from the corner and more towards the centre of the screen, just so I can keep it in view and still kind of keep my eyes on the road and see where I'm going. This green line shows you the amount of feedback being generated and sent to your wheel. Pretty cool, eh? That's, that's physics happening right there. The aim here is to get that trace line just about peeking into the red when the car is under the most load. If you're under that, then just use your increased force feedback multiplier control to nudge it up. Like, just a little bit of red is fine, but if you start seeing flat red lines, then that's way too much force feedback. You're, you're clipping your wheel out, so just adjust that force feedback multiplier down a little bit. Now what this does is ensure that you're getting the maximum detail out of your wheel. Running too little will make the whole thing feel really weak, but too much and it's just going to be washed out. But either way, you won't be getting the most out of the new feedback that's available. 
by using the force feedback meter, you take all of the subjective guesswork out of this, and you get a visual on exactly what's happening with the forces. For example, I found the FRX-17 only needed around 1.5, whereas the Porsche Carrera was all the way up near 3.5 or even 4. Now, something worth bearing in mind is that tyre temperatures can have a big effect on the forces going through the physics. So, some cars that come out the pits cold, such as this Porsche, may take a little longer to dial in until those tyres get up to temp. However, these settings will get saved per car though, so once you find that sweet spot after a few laps, it really is a case of set and forget. Pretty easy. And that's pretty much that, Race Room's new force feedback. I just know that this is going to be a huge talking point in the community, and although these are my views and these are what I think of the force feedback, everyone's going to have a different opinion, so I really would like to know your thoughts in the comments, guys. Let me let me know down below, what do you make of the new feeling in the wheel? Anyway, I've already taken up way too much of this video with just the one topic, so let's go and have a look and see what else is new in this update. And you may have already seen glimpses of this in the past few minutes, but the menu and UI system, which was previously used for the car setup menu, has now been expanded to the options menu and the in-session menu. Everything's got a sleek new dark mode look, with the options being laid out in a much more sensible arrangement, with you even able to search for a specific option at the top right of the menu instead of, like you would before, going through all of the different menus trying to track down one little setting. Another nifty little feature is in the controller bindings page too, where you can now press a button and it will show up on screen, just in case you forgot what you've assigned, or maybe you need to go and check for duplicate controls. Also, there's now a field of view calculator in the display options, which, instead of trying to calculate yourself using a third-party website and then converting across to degrees and multipliers and all that, you now just feed in your measurements and it will set the rest up for you automatically. And yes, it works with triple screen setups too. Looking at the in-session menu is another big change. Previously, everything had its own individual page, such as the timing screen and the session settings and all the rules, which just made things a little clunky. Fast forward to this new update, and on the main screen, we now have everything in one place at the same time, which is much neater and much more easily accessible. There's also now an instant replay feature available, which lets you go back and have a look at the action on the spot without having to wait until the end of the session, quitting out, loading the replay, and then trying to find your spot. Although, be warned, <laughs> when the replay is over and you resume driving, it will just throw you straight back into the action again, so hands on the wheel and be ready. Now this actually ties in very nicely to the next thing I want to talk about, the new replay system. Chris Hay has already put out a fantastic video which talks about this. Link on top of the screen right now. And we can all thank him for this new replay system because he's, well, he's well known for his beautifully cinematic videos. And he has maybe whispered to Race Room about this feature once or twice before. Gone is the old layout with the clunky interface at the bottom of the screen where you had to cycle through each car and camera angle manually. We've now got a much more intuitive layout where you can select from any driver or camera with a simple couple of drop-down menus. You've also got your time controls smack bang in the middle of the screen for ease of use, which is now controlled by the scrolling of the mouse wheel too. And the assignments menu is built into the replay system itself, which sounds pretty obvious, but previously, if you'd forgotten to map a camera move button, for example, you then had to quit out of the replay, map your button, and then load back in again. Not ideal if you're watching a 50 car grid at the Nordschleife. By far the most exciting feature of this new replay system, however, is the ability to add keyframes. Maybe it's just me that's getting excited as a content creator, but honestly, this is just awesome. You can position the free camera anywhere you like, create a keyframe along the timeline, move it to a different point in the timeline, move the camera, maybe change the zoom, play around, make it look all arty, and then add another keyframe, and that's it. The camera will now automatically track between those two keyframes you've saved, and you can even set the type of easing, you know, whether it travels at a constant linear speed or maybe has a smoother motion where it gradually gets to speed and then slows down at the end. You'll need a little trial and error to get used to it at first and see what looks good, but ultimately, your creativity is now the limiting factor when it comes to the shots that you get. Although, that said, these keyframes only work with the free move camera right now. Unfortunately, as, as far as I can see at least anyway, you can't fix the camera target to a car or automate between the different standard shots throughout the lap, such as the TV cameras and the built-in onboards. 
I would love to see if this is possible in the future though, as it would save a lot of time and effort recording multiple takes and then chopping them together to get a TV broadcast style edit like I use in the intros of my loops and streams, for example. And last but not least, Racerooms had a little bit of a graphical improvement in terms of tyre smoke and sparks. Although tyre smoke was there before, it now looks a lot better, however sparks are completely new and are definitely going to add to the immersion of following other cars around the track. There's not really much to be said here, I suppose, because it's just eye candy, so here's some footage. Now just to cover myself from silly mistakes here guys, in the world of patches and updates, things can change at the last minute and often do. This video was recorded a few days before the actual Race Room June update launched, so as always, please make sure you check the official patch notes, link in the video description, just in case I missed anything. But to sum things up, although there are some pretty cool things that are going to change the way that Race Room looks, by far the biggest change in this update is going to be the way that Race Room feels. And it will be completely different than what you're used to, but trust me, once you leave those old habits at the door, just stop trying to compare it to what Race Room used to feel like, and just get a few laps under your belt, you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna love it. It's, it's gonna put a big smile on your face. Just remember to check out that force feedback multiplier, okay? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to leave it a like, and please do share your thoughts in the comments below, because I genuinely want to know what you think about this update. Also, make sure you subscribe to the channel and press that notification bell, so you can see me in action in all of my Race Room live streams every week. Look after yourself, everybody. Go and have fun with the new Race Room June update, and I'll see you all again real soon. Bye-bye.